God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us, whoever believes in him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated, it is well, I'm walking in freedom, because God so loved so
Good morning. My name is Jennifer Wilhelm. I just want to welcome all of you all to worship this morning, whether you're joining us in service or online. Um, we're excited to have you. Um, it is, if it's your first time worshiping with us, we invite you, in the, if you're in service, in front of you to pick up a Connect card. Go ahead and fill it out. You can drop it in the offering plate when it comes through. Um, if you're joining us online, you can also go to our website and enter the same information. Or if you have a prayer request, you can fill out the back of the card and also drop it in the offertory. That way we know of your prayer needs so we can pray for you. Um, now, if you'll take a moment just to bow your heads, say a little opening prayer. Um, Eternal God, you are a rock. You are the firm foundation for everything we build. You give gifts to your people for the good of the church. You equip and train your people to carry out the good works you have prepared for us in advance. As we gather here today, we ask that you would provide wisdom, guidance, and direction. Remind us that you are our loving ally, you are our fortress, you are our tower of strength, and you are our rescuer. Everything we need is found in you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now if you'd like to take a moment to stand up, greet each other, introduce yourself to somebody you don't know. to serve the youth and children here at Watkins. I'd like to invite our kiddos up for the blessing of the children. Well, I have one announcement for our youth. So if you're in middle school and high school and you want to see Pastor Colin try to ice skate, well, do I have an opportunity for you? <laughs> and so it'll be $14. We're going to head to Iceland Sporting Complex. I'm going to re repeat that like last week. Uh, we are not going to Iceland the country. We're going to the sporting complex. And so that'll be on February 17th, I believe. And so the sign-ups are in your emails, and we'll have more announcements coming for you. And for now, um, we're going to change up our prayer posture this week. Can you all hold your hands really tightly? Really, really tight. Then you can close your eyes really, really tight and bow your head. And I'm going to have my people in the congregation, if you want to reach out your hands to our kiddos, and we're going to begin our prayer. Dear God, I thank you that you made us be in relationship with others. I pray over these kids that they know that they have great care and support from those around them. May they be encouraged by friends at school, at recess, at home, or even to their neighbors. May they show your love and care to their friends and family. We say all of these in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen. Okay, let's head out.
and welcome the Watkins. We're glad you're here, whether you're first time here or hundredth time here. Do want to welcome all those joining us online as well. As we get prepared for our pastoral and our offering prayer today, one of the things I want to lift up is that we will be celebrating Super Bowl Sunday coming up and Puppy Bowl Sunday, right? So how many of you get more excited about the Super Bowl than the Puppy Bowl? Any Super Bowl fans? How many more excited about the Puppy Bowl? Okay, there you go. We got some. How many of you don't care about either? Okay, very good, very good, very good. Well, we are collecting, whether you care about all of it or not, we do care about people and, and animals as well as God's creation. And so we are collecting uh, uh, canned goods, canned soup primarily for EACM, one of our mission partners here, Eastern Area Community Ministries. You can bring those in. You'll see we always have the big uh, tub out there for that throughout the year, but you bring them uh, to collect that. And we'll also be collecting dog food and cat food for an organization called My Dog Eats First. And so if you'd like to come to support those two mission partners of ours, I encourage you to bring them in and we can uh, make sure it gets to the right places so we can make sure uh, our, our people are fed and then our pets are primarily our houseless friends, right? Isn't that My Dog Eats First goes towards. And so both things that we care deeply about, I encourage you to bring those uh, next week, and, and I'm sure if it keeps coming in through February, we'll get to the right place. Um, today we come and um, we bring a lot in here. It's interesting, we, we, when I hear people's stories, and with my own story, we do bring a lot into this space. For all the many weeks we've had, <laughs> for all the many things that we have control over in this life, and the many things that we don't have control over. And we bring those in from the, the highest of highs that we have felt, and then the lowest of lows. And the great place about here is that it all belongs, each one of it. And so that's what we bring over to God as well. So whether we are responding in the giving of our tithes and offerings afterwards to respond to the missions and the ministries and the gratitude that we have for all that has given, God has given us. And when we receive a blessing, a prayer, it all belongs. So let's pray with that in mind. Gracious God, we are grateful we're grateful that you have brought us here to this space, whether we are physically here in person or we are online from wherever we may find ourselves. And God, we are thankful that in our highest of highs and lowest of lows, that you are in all places and in all faces. That if we had to have an incredible week full of joy and full of celebration, God, we give you thanks. And if we've just had a no good crummy kind of week, God, we bring that over to you as well. And so, God, we know in this life that that's what it's all about. A community to hold us and to share with us life. A community that we're able to fully engage all of who we are. Not just the, the pretty, shiny, glittery things, but everything in between. And God, we know that we, you hold all of it within your compassionate care. And for that, God, we are grateful. God, we also respond to the a motive of gratitude for all that you have done for us, for all the many blessings that we see and the blessings that go unseen. And for that, God, we are grateful that you are ever present and ever working for the good in each one of our lives. And so, God, as we um, just celebrate the giving of our tithes and offerings, may you do something new with it. May it go for the ways of, of mercy and of justice, of love and compassion and kindness that each person may know that they are loved beyond any measure and that there's a church that is deeply in love with them as well. May you multiply for the coming of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's beloved children said, amen. Let us respond with gratitude. All my words fall. I got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do. And every song must end. Zip. 
for a heart sing hallelujah hallelujah I've got one response I've got just one move with my It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I've always wanted to have a neighbor just like you I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you So let's make the most of this beautiful day 
Since we're together, we might as well say, Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please, won't you be my neighbor? Does anybody else have that song stuck in their head throughout the week? Yeah, yeah. There are worse things. I think that was my biggest comment at the 9 o'clock service was like, this is all I hum throughout the week. Um, which I would argue there are worse songs to be humming throughout the next couple of weeks. Um, I, I'll tell you a quick story real quick. It's it maybe not your sense of humor and it's too much information. I realize that. Um, we are about to venture into potty training with my son Cooper, right? And so pray for us. It's, it's, I'm sure it's not pretty. I'm not sure. We haven't seen it yet. Um, but we have been prepping him with potty training songs. I'm not going to tell you what's in those songs because um, I don't know if I should say that from the pulpit. Um, but anyways, so I would say I would much rather have Won't You Be My Neighbor going through my head than some of the potty training songs in the Tucker household. So yeah, pray for your pastor. That's going to be very fun before the fall to see what that happens. If you have tips and tricks... Let me know. We'll see what happens. But anyways, we are continuing our series called Won't You Be My Neighbor? And part of this is I hope that you have already filled out your uh, block map. How many of you have filled out your block map so far? Okay, a couple. How many of you are working on it? Okay, how many of you have totally forgotten about it? There's some grace in here. No judgment, I guess. Um, but there are more uh, block maps out there if you want to grab one and start putting those down. So the things that I've challenged you to do is put down you know, the people that are all around you, the eight, put down their names if you know their names. And then put down their, their desires or maybe even where they work or maybe even their dog's names. You know, that can work on that map as well. And then more relationship type things. We're going to talk about um, ways that we can move that down the line in today's sermon. But I encourage you to continue to work on that, to look at that, because I think the first step to loving your neighbor is first getting to know their name. And so I encourage you to do so. Next week, I will not be here. So next week, I'm doing a pulpit swap with my friend, the Reverend John Randolph. And so John is, has become a deep, dear friend here in Louisville. He is the pastor at Genesis United Methodist Church. And so he's going to be preaching at both of our services here, and I'll be going to West 42nd Street in Louisville to go preach at his church. And so I, I'm looking forward to him uh, leading worship, the, bringing the word here in this space. He is a fantastic preacher, and you will not want me to come back afterwards. I can promise you that because of how good he is. And so I just encourage you, uh, provide a good warm welcome of, from Watkins to John. He's going to be fantastic. Bring some friends because it'll be a real treat. Um, and so he'll be ending our series, Won't You Be My Neighbor, by focusing on what we as a church, as an outsider, um, has him be an outsider, challenging us as a church to be that good neighbor. And so I'm really looking forward to that next week. And so before we open up God's word for us for today's scripture and sermon, let us go to God in prayer. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we are grateful. We're grateful that no matter who we are, what we've done, or where we come from, you call us your beloved child. There's nothing we could ever say or do to make you love us any more or any less than you do right now. And so, God, as we come around your word once again, once we come around this, the word made flesh found in Jesus in a particular story, set in a particular time and place, may we learn something new and fresh. That we may not only come to intellectually understand who you are, as important as that may be, but that we may come to experience you from the inside out. We ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's beloved children said, Amen. So today we'll look to the Gospel of John, the 21st chapter. This story comes from Jesus has already been crucified and resurrected again, and Jesus makes an appearance on a beach. And so if you're just really wishing to be on the beach right now, much like me, right? Um, this is your story. It says this. Later, Jesus himself appeared again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. This is how it happened. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter told them, I'm going fishing. They said, we'll go with you. They set out on a boat, but throughout the night they caught nothing. 
And early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. Jesus called to them, children, have you caught anything to eat? They answered him, no. And he said, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they did, and there were so many fish that they couldn't haul in the net. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he wrapped his coat around himself, for he was naked, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they weren't far away from the shore, only about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've you've just caught. Simon Peter got up and pulled the net to shore. It was full of large fish, 153 of them. Yet the net hadn't torn, even with so many fish. Jesus said to them, come and have some breakfast. None of the disciples could bring themselves to ask them, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. One of my favorite pieces of furniture in my house. Now, do you have favorite pieces of furniture in your house? Sure, maybe there are some things that were given to you. Maybe they were uh, items that you've passed on from generation to generation. or, Or maybe it's just one that you just think, holds the whole room together. But one of my favorite pieces of furniture in my house is the dining room table. Do you have a dining room table? Sure, it may look and feel and have different shapes throughout your history or season of your life, but we all have tables in which we eat at. But that's also part of the question. Is your dining room table different from the table you actually eat at? I remember when we lived in Owensboro, we had this, this very dedicated dining room, right? This is off and formal, and we never actually ate there. I think I could count on one hand how many times we actually ate at the dining room table. But anyways, the, I love dining room tables. There's something about it. There's something meaning behind dining room tables that, that really speak volumes of what we do as, as people. It's a, perhaps maybe a place that your family gathers around. Maybe it's a place that you had your your neighbors or your friends over. Maybe it's a place that you do homework on the most there. Maybe it's a place that you just stack everything you don't know what else to do with, right? Also an aspect of dining room tables. I asked some some of our friends from this service and the previous service to submit some pictures of their dining room tables just to let us in on uh, how the rest of us lives, right? And so here's a sneak peek of some of our houses around. The left here is Aaron Sullivan's dining room table, and the right are the Wajowski's table, right? Sig and Tracy. Both very pretty, would you agree? I also want to know, did you clean it before I asked you to take a picture of it, or was it already clean? You did take some stuff. Okay, the, the previous service did not admit to any of that, so thank you for admitting that. So here we go, and then here's another two. Uh, the left is Gary Tipton. He's our 9 o'clock worshiper, and the right is Lindsay and Tony Miles, right? Lindsay did admit that the, ta- the chairs were all on top of her table because um, she was going, not because that's where they put their chairs, but because they were cleaning the floor beforehand, but also very nice, right? You know, when you look at these, you think different seasons of life, different relationships, um, uh, they just communicate so much. One, they communicate they're clean, and I'm glad we're fessing up a little bit because some people just aren't as brave to fess up. Here's my, my table, and I have a story to tell you with it. So here's my dining room table. It's, if you were at our Christmas open house uh, just in December, you might have noticed this is in a different room. Uh, I'm going to speak we. Uh, hear me? We love moving furniture around in our house. We love it. We resituate and um, has now made it to our front room. So if you remember, if you were in my house just a month ago or so, that this was in the dining room. That dining room is now a playroom because we just have so many toys and don't know what to do with them, right? What a great blessing. But anyway, so it's there. Now it's moved to the front. You can also see that I didn't clean anything off of it. This is how it was when I went to go take a picture. This is how the room was when I went to go take a picture. So yes, that is a splatter of yogurt on the dining room table. Molly was like, aren't you going to clean it before you show your church? I was like, no, I'm not going to clean it. Um, There it is. 
But this table is very special to us. It's one we, we have done a lot of now arts and crafts throughout the time on. It is also one that we have had friends and family over. Many of you have, have been around this table before. It's a great place just to gather with people. And, it, it, and it's just a really interesting table anyways. The table is actually was Molly's wedding gift to me when we got married. So it's actually built by her father, Bill Schulte. Many of you, he, they usually come here every now and then um, to our church. And so he built it. Um, but the story of it goes like this. The tabletop is actually reclaimed wood. And it's, it's from the ceiling of a, of a house here in Louisville. And it was from a, a woman's house, and she was an artist. And this artist would actually go and show her work primarily in Florida, where I was from. So interesting kind of connection there. The legs of it and the underneath of it are reclaimed wood from a, a house that burned down across the street from the place in which Molly grew up. <laughs> kind of neat, right? A bunch of reclaimed type wood for a new purpose. It's also, if you, you know, I can't zoom in here, but on the top there are a couple different things. It may look rustic and pretty, but there are actually etchings throughout the table. And throughout it, you'll find both Molly's initials and my initials. So you'll see MST and RJT scratched on it. You'll also find our, our wedding date, I think, is on this side of the table. So 7, 15, 16, when we got married, all etched on there. Isn't that neat? It was a really cool wedding present. There's a lot of meanings that come with dining room tables. And for you, it may have a lot of memories that pop up. Both the, the good memories, the celebratory may. Uh, memories and also probably some memories of hard truth of the stuff that has happened and the ways that we have to dive into it together you know i wonder i wonder for our our scene in in the breakfast on the beach scene here what kind of table they were around now they probably weren't as beautiful as the wojo's table or the, or the other tables that are uh, we saw on the screen in front of us but there was something meaningful about coming together around a fire to enjoy some bread and some fish. It's a failed night of fishing. It's one of those kinds of stories, right? And Simon Peter and the disciples have been in there a long time, and they have caught nothing until Jesus appears in front of them. And they realize that it is Jesus, and that even Simon Peter, this is a really strange note that I find no notations, Simon Peter has to put a coat around himself because why? He's naked, right? Does any biblical scholars, why is he naked on the boat fishing? i I do not know that one. So anyways, a weird, weird thing. But so they're out there, they're fishing, they catch nothing, they get super excited. Maybe it's just to get our attention of spaces. Um, but then Jesus says, put down your net, and it is just full, right? Fish upon fish upon fish upon fish. 153 plus fish gather into that net, but do not burst. And it's in there that Simon Peter puts the coat on. He jumps in to see who it is and swims ashore and leaves all of his friends behind. A very classic Simon Peter thing. But it's on that beach in which they gather around and they eat the fish and the bread around a fire with Jesus. Now, I would have much preferred my breakfast of choice is breakfast tacos. I would rather that. And I think perhaps this was it. Maybe they had some tortillas and some fish on there and really enjoyed it. And also a side note that goes with that. Can you imagine, instead of the bread and the juice or the bread and the wine um, communion, we took this communion more seriously, right? Can you imagine on Sunday, like we're about to take communion? Imagine if we had bread and fish instead. Anybody would be a fan of that? How many of you would not like that? As a person who is from Florida and whose parents operate a marina for many, many years, I would enjoy the bread and fish, and maybe one day we'll do that. We won't do that. But anyways, so they're dining around. And is in their dining, is in this conversation, that they start to learn who they are because of whose they are. It's around that fire in which Jesus has created a miracle of creating fish where there was no fish. Of re-entering into their lives where they have been devastated and broken because the person they had followed for the last three plus years was now dead and gone. And now he resurrects and he is in their face again still performing miracles, still providing sustenance when they thought there was nothing left. It's incredible, isn't it? 
I remember growing up, there was a, a few certain rules that we had around a table. Did you have table rules growing up? Do you still have them? Do you teach them? Maybe if you have children or friends, right, this is how you behave around a table. We're still getting to know that with our son, right? Like, this is how we act and how we treat each other. We don't, yeah, we don't, I won't go into what he does at the table. It's not pretty. But anyways, we sit down and there was a couple rules that we had to follow. There's a couple mannerisms that we had to follow to really engage in quality time together. Eating dinner every night was something very important to my family. And that is the part in which we were to engage and re-engage of a family around love. And I think this is what connects to our scriptural imagination. The first thing is, I, I remember growing up, we would always share everything family style. You know what I'm talking about? So there would be the, the entree in the middle. There, that was usually fish every night. And then there was also all the different sides put all around there. So we'd have some salad, and they would sometimes demand that we need to eat the salad, right? And I would have to be coaxed into it. But you could see all around us that we'd be sitting at this long table, and it was usually my, my mom and my dad, my sister and me, and then my nana built the house right next to us on that property. And so she would come down often for dinner as well. But I remember that the best part about this is how communal it was. That you chose how much portions you would get as, as it went around. Now, maybe there was a forced green bean or two that goes along with that. But there was something about the aspect that we all dug in from the same plates. That we all took from the same bowls. That we all kind of just passed around the, the coleslaw, the potato salad, whatever it was, from person to person to person. There was a trust that all were to be fed. That all were to be nourished around this. You know, I think that's perhaps how the people of God found in Scripture also operated. In the early church, there's this mutual sharing of sorts, both with food and then with something else in a second. That it was this, we, we made sure that each person around us was fed with as much as they would want. Now, now, was there a hierarchy of people of like, you know, mom and then dad and then us? And, you know, like, sure. But there was a part of it that there was a mutual responsibility for the other. We'd also have family friends come over. Did you have family friends growing up that would come and join you? Almost like family. The mutual sharing the mutual sharing of stories and food become the part of what it means to share life together. Because it was around that table that we were able to engage and talk around things that actually mattered in life. I think that's one of the things that we have lost where less and less people actually sit around dining room tables every night, right? And that's the chaos of, of busy schedules. That's the chaos of, of the American family is, is kind of ripped. I mean, it's, it's hard to kind of function together as two partners and perhaps with kids to be able to do that. But th I think we have lost intentionally having conversations around things that truly matter. Because we'd come around and we would share, so we'd pass the food around, and then we would start to pass what, how each of our days were. Now, if you were a middle school or high school kid, usually it was just, yeah, I went to school. It's great. You know, that's as much as they could pull out of you some days. So how was soccer practice? Ah, it's okay. Uh, but we'd go through kind of the highest of highs, and so what was the one good thing and lows? Did you ever do highs and lows as a family or maybe a youth group? But in that mutual sharing of stories, we got to know the things that actually mattered to our souls. We got to know what was actually eating at us. And we got to know what was actually the thing that, that brought us the most joy in life. And some of those conversations became pretty surprising. That we didn't know, hey, this would affect somebody as much as it did before. I think we've lost when we don't engage in this the ability to discuss things that matter with those close to us. I want to say this is also something that we have lost within the local church. To be able to engage in things that matter, to be able to have intentional conversations around things, and then we see in the world this reflection of this dichotomy of good and bad, of us versus them. I think part of that is the breakdown of the local church has not done a good job of entering into things that actually matter. That's a sermon for another day. And the other thing that, that we all went around is finishing our plate. Anybody not allowed to leave like the, your chair until you could finish your meal? Pastor Rob never had a problem finishing his meal. I don't know if you can imagine that or not. 
Um, but when you finish the meal, you also got a treat, right? That's when the dessert came. But there was an intentionality part of this that when you're sharing family style, who's the one scooping the food on the plate? Yourself. Yes, there was the demand. You have to take the salad. Yes, you have to take the green beans or the peas that go with it. You got to do that. But there was something of a personal responsibility is what I took is what I was supposed to give out. What I took was what I was supposed to consume. That there was even then, and part of that, a social responsibility. That we don't waste, but we are to be generous and to be grateful for what we have been given. And part of that is under our own control. I think there's a social responsibility for that for us as, as both people of faith and communities of faith. But I also think there's a part of it that, the, that churches and I would say individuals and even myself when it comes to neighboring, this is the part we struggle with the most. Sure, we may start to fill in those, those nine or eight or nine people around us. Sure, we may start to fill in their names, but then we don't get anywhere next with them. That perhaps we, we start to learn a little bit more about their lives, but then we don't finish it. <laughs> but I also want to put this caveat here. Our goal with sharing relationships. Our goal was sharing life together. Our goal of being kind to our neighbor is not so that we can save them, save their souls with Jesus Christ. <laughs> our goal is not this bait and switch thing to say, I will be nice to you so that you will come and be, to be nice with me. Or I'll be nice to you so that you'll come and sit in a pew with me. I think people can smell out that kind of stuff. Don't you agree? Too often... People have been kind of uh, 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 about Christians because that's the way that we have functioned in the world. We get close enough so that we can convert you. I wonder, when we talk about finishing what we've started, I wonder when we start to engage in, with our neighbors in ways that are loving and kind and compassionate and just filled, I wonder inside of that relationship if sometimes that can be enough. That I myself am a converted people, person so that I can be a loving person. Not I am a converted person so I can convert you to my own belief systems. The church has gotten a bad rap for bait and switch rather than I'm here purely to love. So I wonder, when we look at our neighbors around us, I wonder our, our relationship with them. When we look at those neighbors around us, are we able to put those names on each one of those things? Are we able to put their desires, they put in this... Uh, kind of sequence in the art of neighboring that we're studying on Wednesday nights, and you, hopefully you've started to do your homework if you're in my class, that we need to be able to go on this journey of making relationships that actually matter. And these relationships that actually matter are not in turn to make sure that they know, right, uh, that, that, that there's a church. I mean, that, that, that can be a part of it. It's organic. But the big thing about this is so that we are able to show that compassion and that kindness and that place of love because that is just who we are and who we've created to be. So we move from first strangers that at one point we were all strangers in our neighborhoods, whether we have lived there uh, 10 months or we've lived there 10 years, right? We still have strangers. Strangers are people that we don't know that perhaps we may know their face. We may have waved at them when they got the mail and that's basically it. Acquaintance is the way that we move them in relationship to, uh, we start to know who they are. So we know their names. We know their, their, their kids' names. We know, may even, I'll be honest, majority of people, when I first moved in my house, I knew their dogs' names, but not their names, right? And so we would write on our refrigerator um, phone numbers, email address, and names. But one time, I just put LeBron's dad, right? It's not LeBron James' actual dad, but that was the name of the dog. I can remember that, right? LeBron's dad was on there. So we start to form these acquaintances in that we know, hey, you know, I know you, you know me. That's about as far as we can go. And the relationship is a part where we actually dig into their lives. 
Not in a weird, aggressive way. Not, not in a way that, that's a bait and switch the church. But this is the way that I will do things for you and you will do things for me. This is a place where I know I can care and I can have compassion for you. This is a place where, hey, if you need somebody, I know you're there. That there is a mutual understanding that we are here on earth to walk this life together. I truly believe that if each person actually took the serious command from Jesus to love their neighbor, we would form that third relationship with people. And in that forming of third relationship with people, I think we would actually see our world transformed by the love of Jesus Christ. Would you agree? That I think if we actually took Jesus seriously in this command to love God and to love neighbor, there would be no hungry child in this world. I believe if we actually took seriously the, 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 the command to love God and to love neighbor. None of our, our friends without houses would ever have to worry or struggle with security or safety. Because we would just view this is what I'm put on here on earth to do. is to love God, to love neighbor with all that I am. And that's enough. I wonder what that could look like. There's a story. I got to put it, Mister Rogers, here somewhere, right? There's a story, and 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 I love these. Maybe maybe you've seen this before. There's one of my favorite things on TikTok is like the algorithm is a good and a bad thing, right? So things that come up multiple times on your feeds, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, and and one of the time, things that I just got sucked into during the pandemic was satisfying videos. You know what I'm talking about? So you could see like how things were made, right? You could see, you know, how putty's made or how a baseball is made. Or, and you would see the, the process from beginning to end. When we toured one of the distilleries in town, I love seeing the barrel making process as a part of it because I think it's deeply fascinating uh, and kind of relaxing to see something happen to fruition. So before we had those kind of videos, we had Mr. Rogers, right? Mr. Rogers would go and he would visit different occupations. He would, he would visit different people working in different parts of the city. And he would go to car factories to a place. But one of the, my favorite episodes is when he goes and he visits a, a, a place in which pretzels are made. Have you seen this? It's a pretzel making house. It's called Sturgis Pretzel House in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And he goes there, and he goes through this huge journey. I mean, it's almost like going to Krispy Kreme, right? There's something satisfying about that, too. Um, maybe that's just like the hot and ready at the end of the time. But, but they put together all the, the dough, and they roll the dough. They start to make the crisscross shape, and they start to put, like, the salt on it, and they put it into the ovens. And there's something deeply satisfying to see something from start to finish right, happened before our eyes. I'm about to show you uh, a clip from it, and, and I encourage you, though, to Google Serge's Pretzel House. The, if you know the Shorts, Bill and Pat Short, they actually have been there because they're from Pennsylvania, so it was kind of fascinating, too. Ask them about it. Um, they sit over here. That's why we're doing this. They're not invisible. But the Serge's Pretzel House, he's going to talk about in this the origins of the pretzel, and maybe you already know this. I didn't know it until I watched this, um, but I think it's a pretty good thing. So he's going to meet with the owner of the Sturgis Pretzel House, and they're going to have a little conversation. You know, pretzels were first made in Germany, France, and Italy almost 1,500 years ago. Oh, my. And they were given to children for knowing prayers. How do okay? you do? Then we first shape it like a great big U. Mm -hmm. And we take one and we cross it over the other. So this is to represent children's arms praying to God. Then we take one and fold over the other. That represents your parents, mom and dad. We pick up the ends and fold them on back. And be sure you have three holes and look what you made. Wonderful. And the fingerprints in the pretzel is your trademark. That's how yours differs from mine. Does it always have to have three places in right. like that? That's the Holy Trinity. The three holes are the Holy Trinity. I see. Then what do you do? Then we Quiet. cook it like a donut or like a bagel. I'm going to turn around and drop it in the baking soda water. Pretty neat. Did you know that already? I don't know. So the, the folk tale that goes with it is, and, and this is part of history or, or maybe not, is that it first began in German monasteries, right? So they formed there to form and to teach uh, children how to pray. 
kind of fascinating. So you have three holes, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You have this interconnectedness. I saw on these, our, our, green, our green banners have a triquatra in it. So it's the same thing. And it shows the deep relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit kind of together in unity, but also invites us into that same kind of relationship. Kind of cool, right? I wonder, if we were deeply engaged with our neighbors, what kind of prayers we would have? I wonder if we knew their deep desires. I wonder if they knew the, the biggest of highs and their joys and also knew when they just, they're just not having a good week. I wonder what that could look like. After communion, we're going to invite you forward. You're going to come with your palms up. You're going to receive your bread and your juice. We're not going to do the bread and the fish today, maybe another day. Um, but you're coming with bread and the juice. Where you're going to pan out. You may pray up here at the altar. You may return to your seat. On your way out, um, there are going to be people with bowls of pretzels. They're going to hand you one. They will have sanitized hands. Let me put this out there again. I don't want your hands digging in my bowls. Amen? Okay? And so they'll give you a pretzel from their sanitized hands. And what I want you to do is take it back to your pew with you, and I want you to pray for one of your neighbors. I want you to pray for one of your neighbors. My hope is that you know one of your neighbors so well, you know what to pray for. You have a relationship that you know this is what they need. This is what they desire. This I know they, they lost a, a, a parent or a sister. I, I know that they are going through a, a hard time financially. Uh, or I know that they just had their child or, or grandchild, and it's a moment of great joy. I know they're having a great celebration. Um, I want you to lift one of those prayers up around that people. And as you eat it, you don't have to eat it, but if you want to eat it, it's a, just a pretzel. I want you to envision that as a part of being who you are. Of taking in that prayer. And if God, I'm not going to tell you to do it, but if God provokes you to love, so be it. Caring, compassionate, kind, justice-filled. Whatever that may mean for you. That's my prayer. Will you pray with me about that? Oh God, we are grateful. We are grateful that you called us here to this place and that you are the one who not only listens to prayers, but you are the one that is involved in our everyday lives. And we give you thanks for the moments in which you appear before us, whether it's on a beach cooking fish or, or whether it's in that still small voice late at night. And we give you thanks that you are the one that brings comfort. You are the one that brings care. But you're also the one that pushes us outside of our comfort zones to do something new. So God, help us. To help us have a posture of a child to cross our hands and to lift up a, a sweet spirit to you, O oh God. Help us to be able to engage in that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit relationship that we're able to see you in all people, in all faces, in all places. Help us to be a, a truly a good neighbor that seeks to transform your neighbor, the, our neighborhoods by the power of your love. Not as a, a bait and switch, not in the case that we can get in there and sell them something, but that we are able to just show love for love's sake, oh God. Can we do that? Help us to transform Louisville. Help us to transform our state. Help us to transform our world because of who we are. That we're able to be great listeners and people of great deep prayer because we've taken you seriously. We ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's beloved children said, amen. We as a United Methodist Church have something called an open table. An open table means it doesn't matter who you are, you are welcome to God's table. I don't own it. Watkins doesn't own it. So it doesn't matter if you're a member here at this church or any church. It doesn't matter if you have God all figured out or are still wrestling. If God exists at all, you are welcome to this table of grace. 
And so you'll be invited forward after I say a short prayer to come and you'll come with your palms up um, as a signal of grace. There's nothing you could ever do to deserve or earn this, that you are given grace and poured out freely no matter who you are in the form of bread. And you'll also have a cup which is filled with grape juice. Uh, You may kneel at the altar, you may take it back with you with your pretzel, Um, that's up to you. If you require gluten-free elements, just let us know and we'll make sure that we give you a gluten-free cracker that comes with that. Now let us pray. Oh God, we are grateful. We are grateful that on a night in which you gave himself up for us, you took bread and you took juice and you gave it to each of your disciples and you said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We also thank you for for sharing the cup with us when the dinner was over and you shared it with your disciples and you said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood in the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, God, we ask that you will pour out your Holy Spirit in all of us gathered here and all these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by your blood. God, particularly today, in this season, we ask that you'd make us one in Jesus Christ. One as one holy church. And one in ministry to all the world till you come and we feast at your heavenly banquet. For God, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to ask those who are assisting me to come forward, whether you're helping with, with the juice or the, or the bread or the pretzels, come forward. The band's going to play their closing song um, while we do this as well, so they'll lead us um, as we come and we stand and we sing. May you come taste the grace of Jesus Christ poured out for every person here that we may be able to embody that for all people we may come in contact with. Amen.
with my heart oh, take and seal it seal it for thy courts above I wonder if we can sing the first verse again, just the first verse of that song. So let's all stand and sing as we sing that song, as we embody that song. So let's sing it together. So may we go. And that same love of redemption that Christ has for us, that we may go into our neighborhoods, our communities, our schools, our place of businesses, to be a person of tremendous grace, a person of tremendous compassion, because that is who God has created each one of us to be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and peace, my friends.